Good morning, my name is Kyle Wittick, and I'm the Associate Pastor of Student Ministries here at Calvary, and I have the honor of being able to share the message with you this morning. But to start off, I have a question for you. It's rhetorical, but I kind of actually do want to know the answer. How do you get a three-year-old to obey? Many of you know exactly why I'm asking that question. I have a three-year-old at home. I also have a one-year-old at home. One example of obedience that we're trying to work on right now is uh, we don't wake up our younger brother by crawling in his crib at five in the morning. I praise the Lord for my wife who got up with them this morning, by the way. But in my house, typically the answer for this has to do with popsicles, donuts, or anything related to do with the movie Toy Story. But it's amazing how quickly you can get to the heart of a child by discovering what it is that motivates them. Why do children have such a hard time obeying parents and authorities? I think the answer is really the same answer that many of us struggle with obeying God. We think of ourselves first most often. We're selfish. And we think that we know what's best for us even better than God does. In the world around us, just like we talked about a little bit last week when Pastor Danny was sharing with us, they say things that people are basically good. But the truth is, is that we aren't basically good. In fact, even when we do good things, oftentimes we don't do them for the right reasons. Oftentimes what's off is our motivation. For instance, after quite a few times of inviting me to go to a local youth group, my friend Bob, when I was back in high school, finally got me to go to his youth group. And I enjoyed myself. It was a good time. But I kept coming back for the wrong reasons. There was free pizza. And there were also some pretty cool people there. But I wasn't going there to honor God or to hear about God or to learn about God. I obeyed God only because it happened to be convenient for my particular occasion. Maybe that's how it is for many of us. We show up to work for a paycheck rather than to honor God with the skills that he has given us. We serve the community. We go on short-term mission trips. We open the door for people at the store. We let the person merging on the highway in in front of us, even if there isn't room. We give money to the church. We do all different things, all great things. But the question is why? Why do we do those things? So this morning I want to challenge each of us to consider the question, what is my motivation to obey God? So in our scripture passage this morning, we're going to see a stark contrast between a man who chose to obey God and those who either had no motivation or possibly wrong motivation to obey God. So if you have your copy of the scriptures this morning, I would encourage you to open up to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to be starting in verse 9 as we continue our series on Genesis chapters 1 through 11. As you all are turning in your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 6, I just want to go through a real quick outline for you. Um, This morning we're going to be starting in verse 9 going through verse 22. And we're going to start with the very first two verses, verses 9 and 10, talk about God's remnant. And then after that, we're going to talk in verses 10, or excuse me, 11 and 12 about the corruption in the land. And then we see God gives his covenant to Noah in verses 13 through 20. And finally, we see how God provides in the last two verses, 21 and 22. So without further ado, let's get going. God's remnant. Follow along with me starting in Genesis 6, verse 9. These are the family records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God. And Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Right away in verse 9 here, we see God answering the question that maybe many of us were thinking since Pastor Danny left us off this past week in the earlier verses. Why did Noah, of all people, find favor in the eyes of God? Out of all the people on earth, why is it that God would choose to save Noah? 
I want you to recognize that there are two particular words here that are used in the passage that describe Noah. The words righteous and blameless. The word righteous is used over 200 times in the Old Testament, particularly in Proverbs and Psalms, but it almost always is used to reference either God or a person, and it often is standing in contrast of those who are labeled the wicked. In other words, a righteous person is someone who avoids sin. Noah is considered a good man by all means in God's standards. But then we see this word blameless. It's a term used much more rarely than righteous, but it means wholeness or completeness. And those who are referred to as blameless in Scripture are characterized, again, by abstaining from sin and also walking in the law of the Lord. So in contrast to answering this question, why Noah is that Noah is someone who stands unique in his generation. If you guys remember back to last week, Pastor Danny mentioned that as we read through the portion of Genesis 6 earlier, we see the hearts of the people on earth in Noah's generation were filled with evil. This certainly doesn't mean that Noah lived a perfect life by any means, but we come to find out later in in Noah's life that he actually had some struggles as well. But nonetheless, God saw Noah as unique in his eyes. In fact, one could argue that Noah is described more glowingly positive terms than all others except for the Messiah in the Old Testament. There's something to say for that. In fact, some of the words that are described here, describing Noah, are used for people like Job. Job, like Noah, was described as blameless. Abraham was described as righteous. Enoch was described as walking with God. And that's some pretty good company for Noah right there. But Noah and his family are chosen to be the remnant by God to survive this coming flood, which Noah will soon find out about. But why... Does God need to choose a remnant? Wasn't there another way rather than destroying the entire earth? To answer these questions, we continue reading in Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 about the corruption of the land. Please follow along with me. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with wickedness. God saw how corrupt the earth was, for every creature had corrupted its way on the earth. You see, Noah's character here starts to stand out even more brightly as we see the corruption of the rest of humanity. Now, you see, the key to these verses, actually, in these very two short verses, is a lot of repetition that we see. This underlies the gravity of the situation that Noah was in the midst of. The main message here is that the earth is corrupt, that it is ruined, that it is destroyed, depending on uh, which translation you use. It could be any of those three terms. But in verses 11 through 13, the earth is mentioned six times, and the verb for the word ruin is mentioned five times. So in case you don't see the connection, it's emphasizing that the earth is being ruined. And mind you, this is before God does anything. So the importance of God's use of this term ruin is that it's generally used for describing a sudden destruction of people or cities in war through divine judgment. So here it is not by accident that God uses the very same word, corrupt or ruin, to talk about both the earth's condition and also his intended action through the coming flood in destroying the earth. So what God is really saying here is that what he is doing, this decision that he is making to destroy the earth, he's saying the earth has already destroyed itself. It has already ruined itself. Remember further back in Genesis to chapter 1. God filled the earth. But what did he fill the earth with? He filled the earth with animals and he filled the earth with men and women. Yet here we see the scriptures say that the earth has become filled with wickedness. Some translations might say filled with violence. So note how in verse 12, it begins with the two words, God saw. The last use of these exact words is found in Genesis 131, when God saw that all that he made was very good. 
Now, this author uses this purposefully here in chapter 6 because it heightens the sense of the tragedy that we are experiencing here. In Genesis 1, God is pleasantly surprised by his creation. But here in Genesis 6, he is shocked by the corruption that is before his eyes. And we heard again from last week from Pastor Danny about God's justice, that God is indeed the God of love and the God of grace, but he is also a just God. So we're filled with tension here. Because humanity is ruined, because they have destroyed themselves and corrupted themselves, where does God go from here? What is it that he will choose to do? As we continue reading, we see that God decides to make a promise in his great love, but also he hands out some poetic justice. Let's continue reading in verse 13 about God's covenant with Noah. Then God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to every creature, for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Therefore, I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to make it. The ark will be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. You are to make a roof, finishing the sides of the ark to within 18 inches of the roof. You are to put a door on the side of the ark. Make it with lower, middle, and upper decks. And then he says, understand that I am bringing a flood. Flood waters on the earth to destroy every creature under heaven with the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark with your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives. You are also to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of everything, from birds according to their kinds, from the livestock according to their kinds, and from the animals that crawl on the ground according to their kinds, will come to you so that you can keep them alive." So he starts off here with a quick summary of his assessment of the situation. And his righteous judgment, God chooses to ruin the already ruined earth. And in the Bible, oftentimes what you'll see over and over and over again is that divine judgment matches the crime. God's actions are measured. They are just. They are never reckless or unmerited. And God's punishment does not go beyond the ability of his grace to restore. We see this in verse 14. We begin to see God's instructions of how his great plan will unfold. And we will see his grace to restore. He tells Noah to build an ark. And to make it out of gopher wood. Now this is the only place in scripture where we see this gopher wood. And it's translated as a squared or a smooth type of timber. And he mentions then to cover it with pitch, which in today's day and age would basically be considered caulking. And then in verse 15, God gives some particular instructions. How exactly is this ark going to look? How big is it going to be? And he says it's going to be 450 feet long. That's about one and a half football fields to be able to give you a frame of reference. And it's about 75 feet wide, which is about half the size of the, the width of a football field. And then in terms of height, to give you another frame of reference, when you leave the sanctuary this morning and you go out our front doors, I want you to turn around before you leave the parking lot and I'd like you to look up at the height of the ceiling of the highest point of the worship center here. That is 48 feet tall. 45 feet was the height of the ark. So when you leave, you can take a look and you can see the reference of how high that is. Now, since the ark had three decks, there was a lot of space for the animals. In fact, some estimate that the total deck area was almost 100,000 square feet. And then we also see that a roof and a door are also added on the side of the ark. And you know, if you're interested in actually seeing a life-size version, I've heard that the Creation Museum down in Kentucky is unveiling a life-size ark reconstruction in actually just the next few weeks. I think it's the 7th of July, if I'm not mistaken. But up until this point... God has said that he will destroy every creature and the earth. But he hasn't really said how until verse 17. So Noah at this point is probably wondering what in the world and the purpose is of this ark. And he receives some news. God says, understand that I am bringing a flood 
that is flood waters on the earth to destroy every creature under heaven with the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will die. Now, you know, some over the years have argued that this was some sort of localized flood, but God makes it very clear that everything on earth will die. And it's also clear in verses 13 and verse 19 as well. But at this point, you have to wonder, what is Noah thinking of all this? If you're going to kill everything, what's with the huge ark? If that ark is for me, why is it so big? can not I have just made a yacht? This is going to take me like 100 years, right? Am I going to die? Why are you telling me this out of all people? In verses 18 and 19, things become a little more clear. God is establishing a covenant with Noah. A covenant is a promise. And I want to note that God makes this promise with Noah before the flood begins. This is an act of grace by God. And actually, we start to see a pattern developing through the early parts of Genesis. Before God banished Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden for their sin, he clothed them. Before God exiled Cain, he placed a mark on him to protect him. And then now God announces his covenant even before he sends the flood. What I want you to notice in this pattern is that we see God is a just God. He follows through with his justice, but we also see his love, his compassion, and his grace. Now this is the first time that we see in the scriptures the term covenant. This covenant is a promise to Noah, it's a promise to his family, it's a promise to the animals, and it highlights God's commitment to save them from the floodwaters and to never again destroy the earth by flood, which we'll see later in chapter 9 further along in our series. But secondly, the wording in this passage regarding covenant also alludes to the fact that Noah was actually already in a covenant relationship with God. And this would explain Noah's righteousness was a byproduct of that relationship of God and why God chose him. And now through this covenant, Noah's questions start to become answered for him. The ark would have been way too big just for Noah's family to board, but now Noah understands that the animals are coming with him. But before God gets too far in his instructions, We see that Noah's not going to have to round up all of these animals, which would be seemingly impossible. But in verse 20, it shows that God will bring all of the animals to Noah in all of his sovereignty. Now Noah sees that God is going to be providing for him, for his family, and that God will be sparing their lives. And then in the last section today, we see some final instructions of how God will provide for Noah's family. And we see Noah's first reaction to God's plan as it moves forward. Starting in verse 21, we see God's provision. Take with you every kind of food that is eaten. Gather it as food for you and for them. And Noah did this. He did everything that God had commanded him. So in verse 21, we see that God's command to take food reminds Noah that God will not only preserve his life in the short term, but God intends for Noah, his family, and the animals to be able to maintain living beyond just their their ride here uh, on the ark by taking food with them. And as we move into verse 22, there's kind of an interesting note, is that the author here needs to tell us that Noah obeyed. The reason he needs to tell us that is because Noah never speaks a word. In fact, This is more unique than you might realize. Noah is actually the only major figure involved in an extended biblical event to whom we see he doesn't speak at all throughout the course of that event. Why is that? It's because Noah's obedience was expressed not by words, but by his actions. I mean, think about this. Peter, in 2 Peter 2.5, referred to Noah as a preacher of, of righteousness, a preacher of righteousness. And yet, as far as the text records, he never says a word. What is my motivation to obey God? Our obedience to God is motivated by his love and his grace toward us in Jesus Christ. 
You see, Noah was deemed righteous and blameless by God, not because he was perfect, because he wasn't, but because he walked with God. He had faith in him. It was, he was in covenant with God. In all of God's sovereignty, he has now given us a new covenant today. What is that new covenant? That new covenant is that God has created us from the beginning of time to be with him. Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We know also that God has separated us from Excuse me, that our sins have separated us from God. In Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then we also see in Isaiah 64.6 that sins cannot be removed by good deeds that you and I bring forward. It says all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. But God paid the price for sin as Jesus died took upon the sins of the world, and then he rose again in new life. For Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What does that mean for us? That means that everyone who trusts in him and him alone will have eternal life. Many of you know the verse, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have eternal life. And that life, friend, starts today. Life with Jesus starts today and it lasts forever. John 10, 28 says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Friends, this is the new promise that God has fulfilled in paying for our sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ if you and I put our faith and trust in him today. And this is the only way. Just as Noah was saved from the floodwaters, we have an invitation today to be saved as well from death into life. How is it that we are saved? We are saved by faith plus nothing. Our faith in God. What does this mean? This means to us today that being a good person does not get us into heaven. Why not? How good do you have to be? The problem is that we aren't perfect and God demands perfection. That is how good we have to be. We also know that obeying God's law does not get us into heaven. Why not? Because the Old Testament is limited in its helpfulness. The law is limited in its helpfulness to us now that we are under the new covenant. Because even though the law is both holy and it is good, it can't do more than tell us that we have sin. It cannot save us. So what then is the point of obedience? If our obedience cannot save us, what is the point? Our obedience to God is motivated because he first loved us. He first gave us grace through his son, Jesus Christ. So how are we going to choose to respond this morning? The first way, I think we need to do a heart check. We need to ask ourselves honestly, what is our motivation right now for obeying God? And we need to be honest with ourselves. You see, Noah had plenty of reasons that he could have come up with to disobey God. Plenty of questions he could have been asking. I mean, what are my friends going to say when they see me building this boat for the next century? For a century. What are they going to think when I'm building a boat nowhere near water? Are you really expecting me, God, to believe that these animals are just going to come to me and walk onto this ark after I build it? Is this like field of dreams all over again? If I build it, they will come? Does the ark really have to be that big? Can't I spend 10 years on it? Do you have any idea how long this will take me? He could have used excuse after excuse after excuse, but remember what I said earlier about Noah. He didn't speak a word. He just obeyed. How often do you and I need to speak after God asks us to obey? Our first words are often, but God, I was hoping, or that sounds great, God, you know, as soon as I finish, 
So my first question for you is, do you have no motivation to obey God? If this is the case for you, I would ask you boldly, do you know God? Do you really believe the gospel? If you have no motivation to obey, do you really believe the gospel? Do you really believe that Jesus died for your sins? You see, Noah's motivation to obey God was out of the relationship that he had with God. Hebrews 11, 7 says, By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You see, Noah was confident in God's character. He was confident that God loved him, that God desired to show him grace, but he was also that God was a just God who must punish sin. But it was because of that relationship, Noah could trust God even when he didn't fully understand what in the world God was going to have him do. So let me give you a real world example. Let's say this week you go into work and your boss calls you into his office and he says, you know what, I'd like you to change a few numbers on this report that you gave me because our company needs to see some better profit numbers. You know what you're doing is not honest. You know what you're doing is not truthful. You know that your answer to your boss could affect your employment with the company. Do you know God well enough to trust that you are secure in him even if you get fired? Even if you get fired for obeying him and walking with him. To know God, we have to spend time with him. My challenge to you would be if you struggle with motivation to obey, that you need to take time for yourself to read the scriptures, make time for yourself to be in prayer, make time for yourself to reflect on God, and then when you come to a moment in your life where you have to choose between obedience and disobedience to God, you need to ask God for the motivation to trust and obey him even when you don't feel like it. But many of us obey God, and we obey him for the wrong reasons. So what about if we have the wrong motivation to obey God. Maybe you're like me when I was in high school going to my youth group for friends and pizza. Maybe you serve others thinking God has some sort of running tally about the good things you've done and he's weighing them against the bad things you've done. What is your motivation for extra hours at work? Is it for your glory or is it for God's? Or what about those same extra hours at work? Is your motivation so that your spouse has no right to criticize you for not helping around the house if you're working so hard? But here's the problem. Some of us also ask this question. If I realize that I don't have the right motives in my obedience, should I still obey? My answer would be yes. You should still obey. Now, we don't see explicitly here in Genesis 6 if Noah obeyed God for the right reasons. We just see that he obeyed and he did what God said. I would say that sometimes you just have to change the behavior and soon the heart will follow. For example, if you're caught in addiction this morning or if you know someone caught in addiction, addictions often cloud our ability to see reality clearly. And if you struggle with addictive behavior, you need to get help from people who can hold you accountable and point you toward the love and grace of Jesus Christ. But even outside of that, if you struggle, frankly, this is how it was for me when I was attending my youth group with wrong motivations. Yet, in God's grace, I continued to attend and hear God's word each and every week, and my heart followed, and I put my faith in Christ after struggling with that for more than a year. Sometimes it just takes time. If you struggle with wrong motivation, obey anyway. So what is the right motivation to obey God? I've said it several times and I'll say it again. Our obedience to God is motivated by his love and his grace toward us in Jesus Christ. So what practically do we need to do this morning to obey God? First of all, we need to believe God. You need to believe him. This is important in several ways. Believing God in faith 
that is placing your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You need to do that. And if you have done that, then God's word gives you all sorts of promises that tell you truth about yourself, which will motivate you to obey God. The word of God says in scripture that if you are in Christ, that you are God's child. It says in scripture that you have been justified, that you belong to God, that you are a citizen of heaven, that you were chosen before the creation of the world, that you are holy, you are blameless, you are forgiven, you have purpose, you have hope, you are included, you are God's workmanship, you have peace, and you are secure in him. And I could go on for 10 minutes with many more promises that God makes for those who have put their faith in Christ So if God is asking you to do something, do it. Noah did it, and he did it without question. Because God promises all of these things to you in Christ. The second way that we can respond this morning is that we can know that we are secure in Christ. You need to know this morning that you are secure in Christ if you have put your faith in him. You see, Noah demonstrated faith in that he knew he was secure in his relationship with God. There was no question about it. So how do we know that we're secure in Christ? Let me give you an example from my boys again. My boys disobey me every single day. As a parent, that's challenging, isn't it? But at some point, you start to see obedience here and there. At some point, eventually, as time moves on, and I hope for the future, that they'll obey most of the time. But why would they start to strive to obey? I believe it's because they start to develop a trust in me as their father. They know that I am always there for them, that I love them, that I desire to share grace and mercy with them when they make mistakes. But why is it that they would trust me? For example, I've been taking my boys recently to swim lessons. My three-year-old Henry will stand on the edge of the pool and he likes to to jump in into the water, but obviously I have to catch him for him to be able to do that because he doesn't know how to swim yet. And the thing is, is that at this point in time, he does not doubt that I will let him go under the water or he doesn't think that I will let him go under the water. He doesn't doubt me that I will catch him because he's developed a trust with me over time, because I've followed through. In fact, every single time over the last two weeks of swim lessons that he's jumped, I have caught him. And it's out of that feeling of security, of him being in a relationship with me, of him seeing me every day and knowing that when daddy says that he will do this, that he will follow through, that he knows that he can trust me. And it's in that relationship that I have with my sons that they begin to obey me because they desire to, rather than because daddy said so. And friends, I believe it is the same way in many ways with God. When we develop a relationship with him as his children, as we read his word, which includes a vast track record of his faithfulness, of his love, of his grace, of his mercy, and as we converse with him through prayer, we begin to know God's character. What is it that we will see? We will learn that God is trustworthy. We see That when God makes a promise, he will fulfill it. We see that the love and grace that God has poured out for us in his son Jesus, as we reflect on the gospel, that we have all the motivation in the world that we will ever need. Please pray with me. Father, I thank you for giving us motivation through your love and grace to obey you. God, though we do not deserve your grace and your love and your compassion, you have given it to us freely through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. God, you paid dearly for our sins. I thank you that you look down on those of us who have put our faith in you as holy today and blameless and righteous, just like you saw Noah. Father, help us to close our mouths and to obey you with our actions when you call us to do something. Father, I pray that you would challenge us this week in our motivations. I pray that you would help us to bring your word to all those who we come in contact with this week. Father, give us the grace and the mercy when we make mistakes. 
and challenge us in our motivations. Father, we love you and we thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.